Scott Moonville. This morning, I am going to talk to you all about something that everyone experiences. It's called imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome occurs when you're on top of the world. It happens the moment where you're peaking in success and you're just getting out of that drought moment. And then there's that noise in the back of your mind that says, you're not good enough. It says, are you worth it? Do you belong to take up space here? Statistically speaking, 70% of Americans experience imposter syndrome, according to Forbes. For me, imposter syndrome occurred when I was 17 years old. It was July 5th, 2016, and Alton Sterling was murdered. I had no activism experience. I had no networks. I had no money. But I knew that we had to honor his life. That moment would turn into the largest peaceful protest in Louisiana history. Thousands of people came to Louisiana to honor his life. It would happen again. At 18, I was called by the Women's March on Washington, receiving calls from the Obama administration. I was met with my peers who were 13 and 14, and I suddenly was wondering, was I too old to be an activist now? <laughs> we sat on the cover of Team Vogue, and I wondered, why did a little black girl from Baton Rouge deserve to be on this cover? Then again at 19, I applied for the NAACP's Montague Cobb Award. This award was typically reserved for people like doctors and lawyers and politicians. I was just a girl from Baton Rouge. I went on to win the award, and I could only wonder why. At 20, I was called again to develop policy, things that would shift my community for the better. An imposter syndrome snuck on me like a thief in the night. I thought back to the moments of my mother working two jobs in a state that ranks 48th in opportunity and 42nd in fiscal stability. I thought about how Louisiana ranks number one in childhood poverty, but number 48 in education. I remember having to bust out of my community to be afforded an education to become competitive. I began to see advertising that said I should look a certain way and I should speak a certain way that was supposed to groom me to be ready for corporate America. It was things like that, those microaggressions, people telling me that you were pretty for a black girl, or you talk proper that was astonishing to me. Those were the microaggressions that feed into imposter syndrome that black girls hear every day. I went on to come to the conclusion that my successes weren't the phenomenon. The phenomenon was the regularity of how these experiences were not unique. Every day, I noticed more and more of my peers dying, more of my peers being let down by a community that is supposed to serve them. I realized that I didn't want to be a statistic. So every day, I thought, how do I combat imposter syndrome? How do I write my own story? How do I set the tone for little black girls behind me? I thought 
of all of the moments that led to where I am today to be able to stand on this stage, a little black girl from Baton Rouge, to be able to defiantly, continuously show up in spaces that I should never be allotted because society said that I shouldn't be here. But I'm grateful because the awareness of all of this is what made me dangerous. Every opportunity that we have to equip ourselves to change our communities comes from the awareness we have of self. I was no longer scared of a niche being overwhelmed with other people because I was gonna be the best at it. I was no longer worried about what society would expect of me because they ain't have my mama. <laughs> I thought of the 225 magazine cover that read, Myra Richardson wants a seat at the table. And I thought to myself, do I deserve a seat at the table? I also thought they didn't capture how cute my shoes were. <laughs> but all of that to say that we all deserve to take up space. We all deserve to step into who we are meant to be, not who we told we are. So I will say no to imposter syndrome. And I'll say yes to the woman my mother raised me to be. Thank you guys. Woo!